You ready, Mace? Party people in the place to be. Uh -huh. It's about that time for us to ah! yeah. Yeah. What's up, chiropractors? This is Dr. Nick Silveri, your guide up the mountain to a million dollar practice. If you're looking for the roadmap to grow your practice fast, then keep on listening. This is the Path to a Million podcast where I chat with today's most successful practicing chiropractors. And remember, if you want to get there faster, visit GetMeMoreNewPatients.com to find out more about Leverage Media, the most comprehensive digital marketing agency for chiropractors on the planet. What's up, everybody? This is Dr. Nick with Leverage Media, and welcome to another episode of Path to a Million podcast. Uh, I have as my guest, I'm super excited to have him on. Uh, I feel like this dude is doing big things up in the uh, the upper Northwest. Um, Dr. Jeff Danielson, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Nick. Awesome, man. I appreciate you uh, getting in. I, uh, I've done a bad job uh, these last couple of weeks of like getting behind on my, uh, my interview schedule. So like, we're literally going to turn this, we're doing this on a Wednesday and we're turning it around. It'll be the episode on Thursday. So it's uh, going to be, no fresh. that's right. Fresh is going to be, this is going to be the actual, actually the freshest episode we've had. So. <laughs> Hot right off the grill. That's right. That's right. Um, so Jeff, tell people a little bit about uh, what you do, where you're from, what you're interested in, and then we'll hop into uh, your path. Yeah, well, number one, I'm a chiropractor. Um, I'm a practicing chiropractor. I still see patients every week. I don't see patients um, that much anymore because I've got a lot of things going on. But uh, um, I uh, am in Minneapolis, in the Minneapolis area. Had a practice there for you know about 25 years and been practicing a long time. And uh, recently, probably the last eight years, have uh, kind of branched off into investing in chiropractors. And so I think we'll probably talk a little bit about that, but um, I've got five clinics uh, currently. I buy and sell clinics and then I coach chiropractors as well as, um, I, I'm a little bit like you, Nick. I really love marketing. I think, yeah. I, I think marketing is awesome if you have a great product. And if, and, if, and if you have a great product, man, there's nothing more fun than talking about it and figuring out ways to get the product to people. And so for that reason, um, I've always enjoyed marketing my practice and yeah. what I've figured out works for me. I'm now sharing it with others. And we got a program called team doc, uh, which helps chiropractors pour new patients into their practice. So that's awesome. And I like, you might be the only person that I, well, maybe like there's like three people that I know in chiropractic that have more irons in the fire than you do because it's not just the chiropractic stuff you've got like restaurants and like you got all kinds of things going on all the, every time I talk to you, you got something new going on I, I, I feel like I'm always an inch away from getting a divorce because I keep coming home with a new <laughs> business and my wife is like are you stupid what are you doing and so yeah we've got four restaurants I own a restaurant management company uh, recently I've uh, dove into the uh, industry of hospice and home care and so I own three franchises and I'm excited about that as well because that brings quality care to people in the last 90 days of their life versus my entire career so far has been all about, you know, giving quality, bringing quality to the life of people when they're younger and making yeah. sure that they have a great life versus just the last 90 days, which is what I'm focused on now in that avenue of what I'm doing. So. Yeah, I think I saw you uh, actually adjusting someone probably at one of your uh, one of your franchises, like on Facebook, like you were adjusting somebody in hospice, and I think she passed away shortly after. But she went she went out uh, unsubluxated, which was great. Yeah, that's right. If you're gonna go yeah. out, go out unsubluxated, right? That's what I always say, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm excited to like dive into uh, in, into some of that, and I I think that you know whenever I do these podcasts, I always want to like uh, you know talk about the, the path to a million, but then I also like to, uh, just the things that I find interesting about other people. And one of the things that I find the most interesting about you is, um, is just your entrepreneurship and how you've been able to still run a huge practice. Like you've got multiple chiropractors in there. You're, you're um, with the Big Fish program. You've got multiple uh, other offices that you're invested in. But then to be able to do all these like different diverse things, it just, you know, that takes a special mind. And so I always like to, try to get some value for the listeners uh, uh, whenever I find something interesting like that. So yeah. we'll go to that. Well, 
you know, and, and part, part of that, uh, you know, is uh, learning how to have the wherewithal and the capacity to be able to do those things successfully and, and, and not kill yourself and not, uh, you know, wreck your family and, and all of those other pieces. And, you know, uh, I'll answer this question right off because I get asked this question a lot, you know, because, you know, some people know that I own restaurants and, and so the chiropractors will ask me, so when do you think the best time for me to buy a restaurant is? <laughs> and I always, I always answer that question by, by saying, well, as soon as you're ready to like um, lose a bunch of money, that's when, right. you should, that's when you should buy a restaurant. Or, you know, the same thing is true of owning a winery. You know, if you, if you have too yeah. much money and you want to just like give it away, then, you know, buy a winery. But perfect. That's a perfect time. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, and I joke about that, but the, at the same time, what I mean by that is this, it's money that you're willing to lose. You know, right. I, Nick, I don't know if you've ever been to Vegas, but you should never go to Vegas unless you're willing to lose a certain amount of money. You know, don't go, don't go there with a plan to make money. Take right. some money with you that you're willing to lose. And then if you don't lose it, it's a victory, right? But if you lose yeah. it, it's okay. You know, and that's the same thing with a lot of these other avenues because you don't necessarily know exactly how it's going to go. Do what you do, what you're passionate about. And then if you want to explore some other things, um, just know that uh, you've got to be prepared to lose it. And so that's kind of a key piece of that. It, Jeff, every time I go to Vegas, like if you know anything about me, I'm willing to lose it all. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I have to stay as far away from Vegas as I can as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they suck me back in, but uh, I'm yeah. getting better about it. Anyway. Um, and also the best time to decide to buy their restaurant is once they're ready to hire your management group for the restaurant, I would imagine. So. Right, right. <laughs> That's, right. That's how All it right, works. So let's, uh, let, let's hop into the, the path to a million and we'll kind of take our, uh, our exits as we, as we see fit. So um, the first stage in the path to a million is zero to $250,000 a year. So you, um, uh, you started your practice from scratch or did you buy it? Yep, from scratch. All right. And how long ago was that? What year was that when you started? No, oh, that was uh, 1990. Well, 1999 is when I opened my practice. I was practicing as an associate before that. Got it. Okay. And I also said Upper Northwest earlier. I meant Upper Midwest. When you said Minnesota, I was like, I said that wrong. You're not in Portland. So, <laughs> uh, so the, um, uh, the zero to 250 mark what was it that that you did how fast did you get to the 250 mark um and what was it that was the big needle mover for you uh when you opened up uh that's a good question you know and, and I, I have to be honest with you nick um from day one and there's some good and there's some bad in this so i i'll, I'll I, one thing you'll get with me is you'll get transparency and you'll get authenticity and i'm going to give you the honest truth one of my biggest mistakes is I didn't have a coach at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I kind of was one of those guys. I kind of thought I knew it all. You know, I, I was the same. I, I was the same. I went to a ton of seminars and I figured I could just go to seminars and be a seminar junkie and learn lots of different things. And I, I was confident in myself that I could grow a practice. Right. But I never had a coach guiding me and leading me and teaching me certain principles. And so there wasn't really a plan. Um, what I had was I had this, I knew in my heart what I wanted to do. And so, um, and that was to, to help people and to grow a big practice that helped lots of human beings. And so for me, it wasn't ever about what am I gonna do to get to 250,000 collections? Um, it was, what am I gonna do to get to 100 visits a day? And then what am I gonna get, do to get to 150 visits a day? And then 200 visits a day. You know, those were more my, uh, the, my little markers. Yeah. And uh, right or wrong, and there's there's definitely some wrong in that, um, but that's how I did it. And so well, the um, money always takes care of itself if you're helping people. It does. If you have good systems, and I was fortunate that you know um, my wife uh, came, was in the practice with me. She's not a chiropractor, but you know she was helping me organize stuff. She's very organized, and and we ended up with very good systems. And I had a heart this big. And, uh, and, and a drive that is unstoppable. And so I, I, you put all that together and it works, uh, fortunately. But if you're missing the drive or if you're missing the organization or you're missing good procedures, 
uh, stuff, something's going to fall and something's going to crash. So you gotta, you gotta line it all up first and then you can push forward. So, um, so my goal when I first started was I need to get out and get to know people. I want to talk to everybody I possibly can and get them in to my office and any method possible. And so I was knocking on doors. I was, you know, doing spinal screenings like crazy. I mean, I was, I was a crazy man with spinal screenings and, and I uh, love to talk to people. And so that's how I grew my practice to begin with. Nice. Um, when you, were you like walking like neighborhoods, walk, knocking on doors? Yeah. And businesses um, and mm -hmm. apartment buildings. Nice. Um, you know, I, I, I tell the story of, about when I first started practice, I, you know, it's such a different age right now, Nick. And, yeah. you know, in, I know you are so phenomenal at the technology. I mean, you know, I, I am an, I'm a, a midget this big in, in <laughs> comparison to who you are and what you can do. But what I did was I went into apartments and I had pieces of paper and you probably, probably remember years ago, once in a while, you can still see these hanging around where you would have like um, a message on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And then at the bottom, I would have my phone number written sure. like 20 times and then I would do a little snip thing. So then, uh, and then I would go to these apartment buildings and ask for the ability to put it in their laundry room because when right. people are doing their laundry, they just sit in there, right? And they just do nothing waiting for their laundry to dry. And so they would see my little thing and they would, they would rip off my phone number and maybe come in for a free consultation or something like that. That's the kind of stuff I was doing. And I can honestly that, that's say- the, That's the same thing as Facebook ads. It's like <laughs> put it in front of them when they're just like, you know, wasting their time at the laundromat. And then you make them an offer to come in and they click on a button instead of tearing the sheet off. So yeah. you, you, were, you were ahead of your time. You just didn't have the technology. Right, right. <laughs> uh. Well, that's good. So you were out there hustling, like you were, you were doing it with the offices that you, um, that you see now. So this is actually, this is a good question. Uh, just cause you have a lot of experience with this. I know that you, you tend to prefer to buy an existing practice that already has at least some momentum and then you can keep it going. Have you started any of your, the practices that you've invested in? Um, and when you, just to give a little, cause I, I know the answer, but just to give a little context, give people a little bit of an idea of, of how that process goes, but then answer the question for me, do you always buy an existing practice or do you sometimes start from scratch? Yeah, well, what you're talking about is uh, the Big Fish program, the training right. program. Uh, and just to give a little bit of a background of why I developed the program, um, I have always believed, always, always, always believed in a, an associate-driven practice, meaning yeah. two hands cannot do it all, Right. And so the only way that you can really see large volumes of people is, is to either spend like 40 seconds per person, um, which is not, that's not my technique and not my style. I like to blab a little too much. Um, uh, or you have to have other people in your practice. And I love to teach. I, I, that's a passion of mine. I love to see the light bulb come on uh, when somebody gets at something. And so I love to teach and mentor. And so um, when I started my practice, I brought an associate with me from day one. So from day one, I knew I wanted to mentor another doctor and then do screenings together and just, you know, blanket the town with another person. And so I've always had associates. But what I found is that after about a year and a half, associates do this. They shake my hand and say, thanks, Dr. Jeff. Um, I'm going to go open my own practice now. And that's exactly what happens. And, uh, and so I would always reload uh, by finding new blue chip, like awesome people. I go to the schools um, and I speak in the schools and people that are attracted to my philosophy and the way I do things would come and say, hey, can I be an intern? Can I come? Are you looking for associates? And I would always reboot, but then I got to retrain new associates. And I had that happen where they left, they came, they learned. Um, they built up a practice uh, after about a year and a half to two years, and then they left. I had that happen about six times. Wow. And at that point, I was like, this is not going to work uh, because yeah. this, is, this is driving me crazy. And so then I built a program that in, is intentional about training them, but it's also intentional about having them leave. And the way we do it is that once they leave, they're short on two things. They don't have the knowledge to run a business. 
and they don't have the money, the wherewithal uh, to get the loans and do the build outs and all the, all the kind of stuff or to buy a practice, an existing practice. And so um, with, with my financial stability and background and then also um, the wisdom that I've uh, gathered over the years, that then has allowed me to create a training program. Right now I've got eight doctors in my program in my main office um, in the Minneapolis area and they're all training in the program. And then um, eventually once they hit about a year and a half to two years, then we go and we buy a practice for them. Now to your real question, uh, do you buy a practice that is already existing or do you open a new practice? Of all the practices I've owned over the years, and I think we're on number nine or 10 right now, um, only one of them have we started from scratch. And the reason is because uh, we looked and looked for about a year and there just wasn't a practice that was for sale in the area that was worth buying. And so yeah. we decided to just start one from scratch. That I process guess. then is a little bit longer and it's a little bit different. We like to buy them when they're profitable. Um, yeah. That way we can put my young doctor in there and we can pay them a salary from day one because there's already income and there's already profit. And then I get a salary as well, a smaller salary. Um, they get a bigger salary and then we share profit. He gets, you know, or he or she gets the larger profit uh, share. I get a smaller profit share because they're the one that's in there rolling up their sleeves. So, and then it's designed so that at the end of three years, they buy me out and then I'm out. Um, yeah. So it's really paying it forward so that they can then grow their practice and do the same thing. And then I teach them to do the same thing. Uh, so yeah. that they bring in an associate and they buy a practice for them and it just pays it forward that way. I love, so, I mean, I, I love it. Like I, um, you know, I, with eight weeks to wellness, there's a few big fish doctors in there and we've had clients that are big fish doctors and you know, that's how you get, you know, superstars like Justin Nye and Ross and Amy Crane and Matt Frudenthal and Jake Filkins. And like these people uh, they don't want to go somewhere and like stay as an associate forever. And like some people do, like some people mm -hmm. like want to just be in one place. And I would imagine you've probably had some associates along the way that have that maybe changed their mind and have wanted to stay in your practice for maybe longer than the initial period, or maybe they're still with you, you know? Yeah. I, I currently have two people that are in my practice that uh, uh, we've decided that, um, that, that they're, they're going to stay. They've created tremendous value in our practice and, to be honest, I, I, I can't handle this practice myself anymore. I need help. And so um, they've taken on leadership roles in, in my main clinic and, and are looking to stay. But they're also um, looking at um, investing in other doctors. So they're taking on yeah. interns of their own, and they're yeah. going to be investing in those doctors as well as part of the Big Fish program. So they can be, they can be a part of it while under my roof, uh, which is nice. And then eventually, Nick... I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to be feeding daffodils someday. So I, I've got to have an exit strategy for, you know, what happens to this practice and what happens to big fish um, down the road. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, always looking for those people with the right heart um, to be involved and, and take my organizations to where, um, you know, to where they need to be in the future. So. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this for you. Um, everybody that I know that's involved with you, Big Fish, Team Doc is within your like lineage of chiropractors. There's not one person that I could say that I'm just like, eh, I don't really like that guy. Like every one of them is just like a great uh, guy or woman. Um, they, uh, they're successful and uh, they just like, they, everybody's like usually like happy and healthy and smiley and, and uh, yeah, so you do a good I, job. Well, what's fun is you mentioned Jake Filkin's name. Um, Jake is such a tremendous human being. And so he's, He's now my great grandson. So <laughs> my, my son, the person I bought a practice for was, was Justin Nye. Yeah. Justin brought on a, an intern and an associate, Ross Crane. Yeah. Ross Crane uh, brought on an intern and an associate, Jake Filkins, and now he owns his own practice. And so he's my great grandson. That's right. um, which is, Besides the lineage, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a blessing and it's fun. And, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, good people. Uh, that's the only thing you really can't train is you can't, you, you can't train someone to be a good spirit. And so we're look, yeah. we look for good spirits, uh, good people uh, with a great heart. 
and people that have a good work ethic. That's also something you can't really train. You either have it or you don't. But if they've got a good work ethic and they're a good human being, um, I love working with those people because uh, they're very coachable. And if, and if you're just a sponge and you can learn the procedures and learn, learn things on how to do them and how to do the marketing, how to do your books, even if you're bad at it, um, you yeah. can surround yourself with good people and be very successful. Well, I don't know if maybe you've like found some bad ones that I just haven't met yet, but you're, you're <laughs> bad, a, you're bad in a thousand on in the people that I know. So good job. No, it's uh, I, I haven't found any bad people. Um, I've never had a bad one in, in my organization. I've had a few people that um, stopped at a certain point and said, you know what, I'm not ready for this. Or, you know, I, I, um, I'm going to put this in my back pocket for now and thank you for all the knowledge, but I need to go this direction. And, and sometimes that happens and that's okay. It has to be okay. Um, once people get into it and they, they understand the sacrifice that you make when you're an entrepreneur, um, yeah. some people are just not ready for that or, you know, uh, what have you. And so that's, that's okay too. Um, this is this is a uh, a little bit of a tangent just because I think there's a lot of people out there that I get this question a lot. You know, should I buy an existing practice or start from scratch? I always say buy an existing practice. But um, what is it that you're looking for when uh, when you're doing an assessment of like I assume you guys pick an area that you want to be at first and then you look for practices or do you look for practices for sale and then they just go there? Yeah, no, we, we look for a practice in the area that the, that the doctor wants to live, you know, or wants to be in. Um, you know, they, they don't all live in the same area that they practice. Um, yeah. But, you know, for example, let's say, let's say somebody wanted to be on the southern, in the southern suburbs of the Twin Cities. You know, so we would look for a practice within that area because that's kind of the area that they like. And so... Um, that that ends up being the way way to do it um and there's there's a lot of piece of pieces to finding the right type of practice it has to you know I, we've we've learned along the way uh, we've taken our lumps that you know if if i have a doctor that wants a pediatric practice then we should not be looking to buy a personal injury practice right you know or we should not be looking to buy a medicare driven practice and, you know right. those kind of things and so we we really look at the pie you know what kind of people is this clinic serving what kind of techniques are they using um and then of course all the stats you know we we want to we want to know all the the information from the profit and loss and and know how it's making money where it's making money from uh, what are the connections because you don't want to get into a practice that all the referrals are coming like from one attorney that's putting your eggs in a lot in a in one basket and right. when that doctor leaves you know it's possible that that one source leaves too so there's a lot of factors that go into it got it um what what's usually like the size of like what's an average size of the practice that you're looking at is it are they in that like 250 a year mark are they bigger or it's just kind of like all over the map yeah no it's all over the map but i think we've we've kind of um you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard to say this, but uh, there are so many variables that determine the value of a practice. Um, right. But in general, we look for practices between 150000 and 300000 That's kind in of- In collections or value? Uh, that's, that's the purchase price. Got it. So the purchase how much, price, like for a, for a $200,000 practice, how much, it, like, in general, are they usually bringing in per year collection-wise? Oh, probably half a million. Okay. So I, that's, a, that's another conversation for another day of just like how to value a practice. Cause I think sometimes people are a little bit skewed in, in how they value them. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, what was I? I was, go ahead. Well, well there, there needs to be, and, and I can't say this strongly enough, there needs to be a formula for how you come up with the value of a practice. And our profession sucks at this. I mean, right. I mean, you hear all kinds of different ways to come up with a value. And I mean, we could do a whole podcast just on how to value a practice. But the bottom line is this, the value of a practice is based on four things. It's based on uh, the accounts receivable, how much money is out there that's been billed and not, not been collected. So that's, that's one piece. So we might come into a practice and buy $600,000 worth of accounts receivable, um, but maybe only 
200 of it is actually collectible and we have an entire formula just to figure out what the accounts receivable is worth. And then we have equipment. So you got accounts receivable and you got equipment, you know, digital x-ray machine, how many tables do you have, you know, how many computers, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so you have a price for the equipment that's in the practice. And then you have what's called the blue sky. And that's just the, the, the value of the practice, what it's bringing in. And that's all based on the, on the previous 12 months of profit and loss. That's, that's just pure and simple. How, how much money is this practice bringing in? And that has a big part of determining that. And then the only other thing we give some value to is uh, tenant improvements. So if, let's say you remodeled your practice and put $40,000 into it two years before you sell it, um, you'll get some of that back. Um, the, the seller will get some of that back because they just put a bunch of money into the practice. So that would be the fourth one, but that's not as common. Not too many people are dumping a bunch of money into their practice, you know, within four or five years before they sell it. So. <clears throat> Um, all right. So the, the next step is really going from that 250 to 500 mark, um, in your own practice or in some of these practices that you've helped, especially if they're, if you put somebody into a practice that's at that stage, what's yep. been the biggest things that they've needed to do to, to go from 250 to 500? Yeah, no, it's interesting, Nick. I, I did a, I did a talk, uh, probably about three or four years ago now called the big gulp. And I, I still remember the slide that I made for my presentation was a picture of like the 7-Eleven Big Gulp. Mm -hmm. And um, all throughout my career, there have been moments that have made me swallow like that big gulp of, oh my gosh, can I take this on? Yeah. Um, and the big gulp is different in every step of the way. So what you're talking about in going from a two hundred fifty, two hundred fifty thousand $250,000 practice to a $500,000 practice you know, in revenue, there's just a big gulp in there. And it usually means humans. Right. It usually means you need to hire people. Your, most, uh, your two biggest expenses are going to be your, your rent and, and then your people. And right now, like in my practice uh, here in the Twin Cities, I've got like 22 employees, something like that. That's a lot of staff. That's a lot of humans that are on the payroll every single month. And, you know, adding one more person. You know, I remember back to the moment uh, when I hired a marketing person and I thought, oh, man, this is stupid. I can do this marketing. I've got this whip. You know, I don't need to hire a marketing person. Right. That was the, one of the best decisions I made. You know, Terry... Yeah. Terry is like my, my arm. I mean, she's, uh, she's a phenomenal human being and partner for me in doing all the marketing stuff. And I could never do what she's doing. And we, we grew another big chunk when we just hired that position. Yeah. And, and, you and I, I, I remember also, go ahead. I'm sorry. I remember also when we made a decision from going uh, from my small space, which was I think 1700 square feet to buying a building and my, uh, my rent per month went from like a little over $2,000 a month to $25,000 a month. And that was a big gulp. You know? big, yeah. Now I bought the building. And so there was some intelligence behind, you know, okay, now I own this building. It's 18,000 square feet. My clinic takes up 8,000 square feet. I've got 10,000 other square feet. That's common area, conference room, bathrooms, uh, fireplace, lounge, locker room. And then I've got uh, nine other um, tenants in my building that pay me rent. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, I'm pretty close to paying off the building and now it's going to cash flow really well. So, but it's been a lot of years of going through this. And so there's, there's a lot of things to consider, but that was a big gulp moment when I was like, can I do this? Can I, can I go from only paying two grand a month or 2,500, something like that to 25,000? So that was a, and you've said a, you've said a couple of, you've said a couple of things now that have just been like wow like going from two thousand to twenty five thousand a month is definitely one of them. The other one is like oh I remember what I was going to say earlier is I want to at some point we need to have this conversation probably not right now but like I've never heard of somebody starting with associates like from yeah. zero starting with one so that is fascinating well, to me. But the the two to twenty five thousand is like wow. <laughs> well, 
one of the things that I've been so blessed with is that first person that I started as an associate. Um, I could not promise her anything. It was, uh, you know, probably one of my best friends in, in the profession, Charlene Lindbergh. And Charlene, she's like my sister. She's my, you know, she still practices with me. And um, she, took a, she took a gamble on me because I couldn't pay her a salary. Yeah. So think about it. Most chiropractors coming out of school these days, you know, they need a salary because they've got huge loans, you know, and so they, they have to have a salary because, you know, you can't build a practice fast enough to, to do that. And so uh, she, she came on with me and I, all I could promise her was a percentage and she took it because she believed in the mission. And, and that's, that's, that's where it had to start from. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, can you take out a big loan and then pay an associate from day one? You could, but I didn't have that money. So I didn't have the money that I could give her. So um, the, what you said about, about Terry um, is, uh, who's great, by the way, um, the, you know, you and I, you're, you, you probably are more of an executor than, than I am, but I think both of us are, probably have a lot of that visionary inside of us, and we need executors around us. And for those of us that love marketing, some, that was always my hardest thing to let go of was the thing that I liked. It was easy for me to to hire a front desk person. It was easy for me to hire associates. Um, it was hard for me to hire my first marketing director, but then the world opened up. Like that's the reason why we have leverage today is because I was, it, it was the aha moment of like, oh, this is what chiropractors need. They need me to come up with the ideas and my team to actually execute it for them. Because if you just offer a chiropractor execution that doesn't have any good ideas, you're just executing terrible ideas. And then if you, if you're looking for like a visionary, like coaching, if you're, if, you're, um, if you're looking for a marketer to like come up with the ideas for you, but you're not an executor, nothing's ever going to get done. So it's like you yeah. kind of need both if, if you don't have either, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the biggest problems with, one of the biggest problems with successful chiropractors is that because they are good at a lot of stuff that they, they think that they can need to continue to do everything. And, um, one of the, one of the best moments in my career came when I was sitting at lunch with Patrick Gentempo. And I, 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 at that time I was trying desperately to reduce my hours, um, of adjusting and allow my associates to take on more of my patients. But of course, I think that my patients only want to see me, you know, and of course, that's all the patients say. They all say that they want to see me because if they're given a choice between the owner that you know or some new doctor who's younger and inexperienced, who are they going to choose? They're always going to choose the doctor, the older one, you know. But Patrick said this. He looked at me. He shook his head and he goes, Jeff, do you train your associates? And I said, of course. He said, do you train them? Well, I said, they are so well trained and they do such a great job you know because it means a lot to me that if i'm going to turn over you know new patients and whatnot to these people that they do a really good job and he said if the, if are they 80 percent as good as you and i said yeah i would say they're probably 80 percent as good as me he said then people aren't going to stop care if if they get 80 percent as good of an adjustment so right. start turning people over and allow them to, to have this, you know, 20% less quality adjustment because people aren't going to leave. And guess what? That associate's going to get better. That's right. And if you keep doing more, you're going to get worse. That's right. <laughs> right? So, you know, and, and after I can I only imagine... Like I, I know Patrick and I can only imagine the confusion in his eyes as he was, as, as you were saying this to him. <laughs> right. Uh, he's probably just thinking I was such an idiot, you know, but uh, you know, at the, end of, at the end of the lunch, I was like, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. You know, and at that yeah, moment yeah. when I started to let go and I've continued to let go and let go and let go and let go. And each let go has been hard because you think that you are the one that can do it the best so therefore you should do it and that's not the case yeah. um but you know now i'm down to, to practicing about four hours a week 
and uh, I practice a couple hours on Monday morning and a couple hours on Thursday afternoon so I can still get my hands on some people and, and help some people. Sure. It's, it's my favorite four hours of the week, but it's pretty limited. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's probably like the Beatles around there when you open up those adjusting hours, like rushing in. It's like what? It's like the Beatles in the, in the late 60s when you open oh. up those adjusting hours, like well, they just come flooding in. <laughs> no, what, what happens is this. When I, when I come out, uh, people look around and go, you're still here? <laughs> You know, they think I retired or something. It's like, yeah, I'm still here. Somebody's got to pay the bills around here. That's right. So, yeah. You're, uh, they, this, they pull me up. this is the only thing that I, that I think I got you on. Uh, like, when I walk around, my, like, I'm in my office right now. Like, if I walked out there right now, they can tell that I, like, must, like, I must be important because I just, like, walk wherever I want, you know? But I, like, I'll go to the bathroom, and you know, it's on the other side of the building, and they'll just be like, I'll hear them whisper like, who is, who is that? <laughs> just like they don't even know. Like, the patients don't know who I am, which is uh, my favorite part. Um, like, uh, but yes, they, they keep me hidden away for sure. Um, all right. So we've got, the, we've got the 250 to 500. You think that the people are really the, the part that will allow you to, to grow there and just getting help. On the, this next stage is always the trickiest one. This is the one where I think even the successful doctors get stuck at. And that's the 500 to a million mark. What do you think? And this is probably your sweet spot. This is where you buy those practices and you're trying to blow them up. What is it that makes the biggest difference right there? Um, it's the answer is still people. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm still going to be a broken record there because it's not like there's some magic piece of equipment that you can buy or some magic something that you can purchase or yeah. some system there isn't it's still people but it's people that can produce um more services and more cash flow into the practice so um in my practice uh here in, in minneapolis we added physical therapy mm -hmm. um and um I, I thought that would be um you know i you know, from way back when I, I always, I always thought, well, that would never be something that I do and, uh, is to add physical therapy. And then what I realized in my practice is that I wanted to be able to give certain exercises to people so that they could hold their adjustments longer and so they could stay well and, and be more fit and more flexible. And I didn't have the time and I was scared to do it, to, to, to take that big gulp and, and bring on um, uh, physical therapy, uh, you know, practitioners, because I felt like they would just want to do things their way. And that was, that was a mistake in my thinking is that you can add a physical therapist. If you find just like a chiropractor, you find the right physical therapist that has the right heart and the right philosophy. And sometimes you have to teach and train that philosophy because they don't know um, you know, the chiropractic philosophy, just right. like if you're doing an AWW practice and you've got trainers that are training people, they need to learn chiropractic philosophy too. And so, um, and, and so, and I've never hired a, a medical doctor in, in my chiropractic practice, but the same thing would be true there. You know, if you brought on a, a medical doctor, you would have to, you would, you would be in control of how the medical doctor practices. Okay. Right. We need medical doctors on this planet. We need them, but we need them to do things the right way. Okay. And we all have our opinions on that. And so if it's under your roof, you can control it because every single one of your patients has a medical doctor. So why wouldn't you want them to have the medical doctor that does things the way you want them to do it? Okay. Right. And I'm not pushing everybody to hire medical doctors. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying it's, it's possible and you could do it. Yeah if you want to bite that off, if you want to chew it. And uh, so that was one of the big steps is I, I opened a physical therapy gym, 1800 square feet of physical therapy gym. And it's been awesome. And we have great physical therapists. And, you know, that was, that was actually, that was what took us from a 1.7 million to a 2.3 million. So that was the jump that took us from, from, from that. But you can, and it's, and it's, and it's just like a bolt on, uh, service too. It's not like you're um, cannibalizing something you're already doing to pay for this thing over here. 
it's just like, here's an extra thing that a percentage of my, that's why I love the right. ABC wellness model is because if you've got chiropractic, that's great, but they're going to get massage somewhere. They're going to get exercise somewhere. They're going to get nutritional advice somewhere. Yep. If you can put it all under one roof. There's a certain percentage of those patients that, that like it in your office. They want you to have more services. And um, yep. so I'm a big believer in that because we just have, you know, I like having like multiple streams of income because you never know. Well, not even income. It's just more how, how can you get new people in the practice? Some people might like massage. Some like might, like they might want to lose weight or acupuncture or something other than chiropractic. But if chiropractic is always your, your front facing offer, there are lots of people that don't like chiropractic and aren't yeah. going to come in no matter how charming you are on a Facebook video. So yeah, but there, if you give them but something that they people, might like. There are people that will come in um, because they got a gift certificate from somebody for a massage and yeah. they'll like the place. And they will um, come in then as a chiropractic patient. You know? I, like massage is the, is the best lead magnet for chiropractic patients because it's something that they want whether they think they need it or not. With chiropractic, they have to think they want it. Or they, I'm sorry, they think they need it. They have to have a problem that they determine is a chiropractic problem. And then they have to want to see a chiropractor. Right. Otherwise, right. Like, they're, not coming, they're not coming in just to like, you know, optimize their nervous system. Yeah, yeah, I, I used early in my practice, I used to be more of a purist. You know, I'm going to only do chiropractic. I'm only going to do this. You know, and I, I was that kind of uh, the more of the bullheaded chiropractor. Yeah. Now, what I have come to believe is that everybody needs chiropractic. I, I believe that from day one, but mm -hmm. I believe that we need to find people and get people in, in any way possible, because literally we're, we're about saving their life. So, right. so whatever way we need to get them in, if we need to get them in by having them try massage first or PT first or nutrition first or what, I don't care what it is, as long as we end up with them on my adjusting table so that I can adjust them and turn the power on their body. Um, we'll do whatever we have to do. And chiropractic becomes the foundation for everything that we do because it controls everything. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know, it's right. uh, without chiropractic, everything else doesn't work nearly as good. I'm excited for, uh, for the, the first year that you decide that you should have an H and R block in there for tax season to, to get them in. However you can get them in. <laughs> I, I, can, I will go on the record and say that will never happen. <laughs> oh, Lord. We'll see. We'll see. Um, all right. So is that where you're at right now is 2.3? Yeah. Last year we were down a little bit. We were still above two, but uh, uh, down a little bit this last year. But uh, so I yeah. kind of, th this is probably a little bit more like fresh and with, with your actual experience in your practice. What was the thing? When was when did you cross a million for the first time? Oh boy! To be honest with you, I have no <laughs> idea. It was probably like 1999 as well. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, you know, I got to be honest. Uh, one of my biggest failures is not thinking big enough, Nick. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of people out there that think that same way because um, they're like me. Um, they think that contentment is right around the corner, and oh, you know, once. Once I'm collecting forty thousand dollars a month, mm -hmm. I'll you know I will never need another nickel more than that. You know I can be you know so content with that. But you, the dollars are driven by your mission, yep. and driven by what you do with your mission and accomplishing your mission. And all of a sudden, you turn around and you go, "Holy crap! We collected seventy nine thousand dollars last month." Or mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I, I never in my wildest dreams did I ever think it was possible, nor have I ever tried with the intent to collect over $200,000 a month. And we've done it regularly. And I never thought that that was like, I thought that was crazy. Who would, who would want to do that? That sounds nuts. Right. Um, but it all comes from just your mission and your procedures and hiring good people and you not doing it all and trying to be Superman and just all the things. So, um, so yeah, I, I have no idea when that, that day was when we crossed over that threshold, but I, I remember multiple times along the way, you know, looking up at the sky and saying, Lord, why, why are you blessed me like this? I, I don't understand. And, um, 
and I, I, ne I have never deserved it, to be honest with you. Um, but I am, uh, I'm very blessed. Yeah. Well, 2 million is definitely in the 1% of the 1%. So what are the things, what are like the biggest challenges that you have right now at that level? And, and what's, what's your kind of like next uh, thought process in terms of growing your individual practice? Yeah. Um, well, I, my, my biggest, my biggest nut to crack every, every month is my overhead to run a business that collects that, you know, yeah. overhead. <clears throat> um, to be honest with you, the, the size of the practice where it's at is probably not the, the best sweet spot to be in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, probably the better sweet spot would be at that one, four or one, 1.5. Yeah. Um, because my monthly nut to crack is huge and and the percentage of your overhead rises um as you get bigger and so that's added stress it takes, it takes more people yeah it takes more people and more humans and there's more risk because right. now you know now you're on the hook for a bigger a bigger place to rent and you're on the hook for you know, uh, all the different things that you have to pay for. Um, and so it, most, it, of your, most of your overhead up to that million dollar mark is pretty fixed. Yeah. And then yeah. once you go over that, then it's like you're having to add people and, and the, the profit margin on people is, is a lot lower than the profit margin on your utilities. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, it's, there's no prize that you get. There's no ribbon that you get pinned on your chest when you uh, collect more or whatever. Um, it just has been what it's been. You know, you know, as a business person, you know, maybe I should put a cap on the number of new patients that walk in the door, but that's not our mission. And right, so, right. and so ultimately we, we follow our heart um, maybe a little bit too much in that regard. Um, and we, we keep, you know, dialing it in and, and uh, working hard to contain costs and, and stuff like that. But it's, you know, the other piece of it is who's going to buy a $2 million practice? I mean, eventually I got to sell this thing, right? Yeah. Well, who the heck is going to buy that? You know, how many people are, what's, what's my market? It's like, it's like uh, you know, Kevin Garnett, when he, when he moved from Minneapolis to Boston, when he got traded from, uh, uh, from the Timberwolves to Boston, well, he had a, a place on Lake Minnetonka and it was $23 million. Well, what's your pool of human beings that are looking for a $23 million house to buy? You know, it's really small. And it's the same way. Other, other, other Timberwolves and Jeff Danielson. Those are the only, <laughs> no, no, not, those are like the only not small people. <laughs> no, but, you know, I mean, you got just a handful of people. I mean, it's, it's so the same thing is true in your practice, you know. Sure. Um, yeah. And so we're, we're really setting the stage to build from within and, uh, and find people, you know, this practice ultimately is not going to be run by one guy anymore. It's going to be run by a group. And, yeah. and that's, the way it's gonna, that's the way it's going to work. Um, at that 1.5, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on the, if you've got a main doctor and two associates doing the 1.5, you think that that's really like the best sweet spot. What's the, what's the, uh, pers let, let's say that the doctor is still seeing a third of the patients. And then let's say that the doctor's seeing no patients and he maybe has three associates. What are the, what are the profit margins on those two situations at 1.5? Well, I mean, your profit margins in either situation should be between probably somewhere between 50 and 65%. Uh, if you have more help, and you're not doing as much, you're probably closer to the uh, 62, 65%, you know, um, overhead. Um, no, for, I'm sorry. You, you, you almost, you almost picked yourself up. However many people are listening to this as big fish clients. If your model has a 65% profit margin, no, I was right. like, holy, I was like, holy cow, like, how is he doing right. this? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just talking about overhead. Uh, sorry. sorry. Okay. Okay. Flip, it, flip it around. Flip it. the yeah, other. That makes more sense. That makes more sense. So if you're seeing more of the, you don't think that it's more profitable if the main doctor is seeing like a third of the patients? Oh, it would be. It would be more profitable. Yeah. The, more the, the more the owner doctor does without hiring people, the more yeah. profitable it will be. But that's going to affect your lifestyle. So now your choice is what do you want? You yeah. know, do you want more freedom or do you want a few more bucks in your pocket? Got it. 
So my, like my situation, I don't see patients. I have two associates and I need a third one to, to grow to that level. Um, you're thinking 35% would be a good uh, target at that level. Yeah. 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 You know, um, boy, you, you don't, you don't want to be up near that 70% or above that. Um, yeah. Although, you know, you and I can say this about chiropractic practices, but you know, I'm in the restaurant industry where a profit <laughs> margin of 7% yeah. is awesome. Yeah. But people want to, the people want to go out and uh, drink beer and, and eat good food. Nobody really <laughs> wants to come into a chiropractor. <laughs> yeah. But you know, so we talk about, you know, Oh, 65%. That's way too, you know, that overhead is way too high. Well, yeah. In the restaurant world, you'd be a bajillionaire, you know, but it's, oh, it's, for just, sure. it's just a different business, but yeah, for sure. Um, so what's the, uh, uh, so your biggest issue right now over the next like five years is really like looking for an exit strategy. Um, no, not so much over the next five years. Really what I'm looking to do is have a bigger impact. And so, um, you know, I'm continuing to invest in more chiropractors and uh, yeah. now I'm teaching people how to invest in chiropractors. So I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the process of developing a program. Um, it's, it's called the PIFF program, P-I-F-F. And it's, it's, that stands for Pay It Forward Focused, where we teach chiropractors how to do what I'm doing, which is investing in clinics. You gotta, you gotta be a mentor, a teacher, and then you invest in clinics. And then, and then you pay it forward that way. So I'm, I'm building a webinar, um, <clears throat> a module program to teach people how to do that. Uh, because each, each, each time you do that, there, there is a reward. It's not just a feel good thing in your heart, which it is. Um, and it's a wonderful thing for our profession because it makes sure that these clinics are going to be successful. And that's a sad thing in our profession um, is that so many chiropractors are going out of business because they just never had the business training. Yeah. By doing the business training, we're assuring that these practices are going to be viable and they're going to be successful. And so it's, it's wonderful, but it also rewards me. You know, um, you know, all of them are a little bit different, but they vary between about 200000 and 450000 is what I make for every clinic that I do this for. And so it is a profit center, but it is huge risk because mm -hmm. you're buying a practice and you're not working in it. Right. And you're trusting that that person that you trained is going to do a good job. You're in bed, you're in a partnership, you're in bed with somebody and guess what? You're on the hook for the loan to buy that practice. And that practice was uh, $350,000 and there's a lease on the, on the space over a period of seven years. Maybe it's five year lease. It might yeah. be a $700,000 lease and your name is on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my name's on, on the lease for 700 grand. My name is on the loan for another 350 grand. I'm a million dollars at risk in this thing. And so I don't feel bad, you know, when I make some money on the back end when it goes well, you know, not yeah. at all. But, um, Cause it is, it is very risky. Sure. So, uh, so big fish, um, is the, the coaching program right now, as well as how you do this. And uh, people can find out more about that at mybigfishenterprises.com, correct? Correct. Yep. And then we didn't get a chance to talk in depth about the team doc, but I definitely want to like bring you back on for that. This was a little bit more focused on, on your practice and your path, but I definitely want to bring you back on so that we can dive into the details on the big fish side, the, the PIF program and the, the team doc, because I love the team doc thing. And I think a lot of people um, would resonate with that and uh, find value yeah. in that. And then also, yeah. I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, if, uh, if, if anybody's listening, just goes to mybigfishenterprises.com. Um, you can see information on Team Doc. Team Doc is just basically a program that I created uh, for my own clinic to yeah. pour more uh, patients into my clinic. I don't do as much spinal screenings anymore. I do Team Doc. Um, that's, that's where we get the bulk of our new patients. Um, uh, last year, uh, my main clinic, we, I think we just got the number 726 new patients uh, is what we saw in 2019. And, um, about 60% of those were from team doc. So if you're interested in just rocket fuel for new patients, that's what team doc is. 
Um, but I, uh, on that, on that website, it talks about my coaching as well. And, and I coach, I, I only have room in, in my schedule for a handful of, of clients that I coach. Um, but yeah. my coaching style is, is life. It's, it's doing life with people and helping people make good decisions in life and in business. It's not just what's the magic, you know, script to tell somebody, you know, when you're doing a report of findings, there's plenty of other coaches that can do that. How do you manage through life? How do you do some of the stuff that we've been talking about um, and, uh, and have a greater impact on your community? That's the kind of style that I like to coach in. So if anybody's interested in that, you can find out more on that website. And the last thing I want to talk about kind of dovetails with the impact. I'm so pumped to see, we talked at, I think it was at Cairo Fest about, about a podcast and that you should be doing more content. And so you just launched uh, your newest uh, venture, your podcast, uh, and the name of that is? Cairo Feast. So one of the biggest things uh, when I coach other chiropractors I, that I coach them to do is to train your staff. And so many chiropractors don't want to do it. They don't want to take the time to, to role play and to train and to teach and to mentor, not just your associates, but also your front desk staff, your billing team, your marketing team, coach everybody, be willing to coach everybody. And the next question I get is, well, what should I coach them on? And, and everybody falls down on what kind of topic should I coach on? So finally I gave in, Terry was bugging me for like the last three years or at least that's what she claims. Three years, she's been <laughs> bugging me to do a podcast. And finally, I gave in and I said, okay, but here's what it's going to be. It's going to be on topics that will help people not just be better chiropractors, but also live better lives. And so we're talking about all kinds of stuff. In fact, if anybody's listening, that's in a different business, like if you're a dentist or you own a, a bakery, I don't care what you do, you can listen to Cairo Feast and you can find some nuggets, um, some little morsels, some, some bites that are going to be really good for you in your life. And so it's content that you can then take. So it's, yes, you can listen to it and you can learn from it. But the, the focus is to pay it forward. You take the podcast and you give it to your associate and you say, listen to this. This is, is something good for you to listen to. And I, I have them in about 20 to 30 minute snippets, most of them, although some of our interviews go along like this one, but, yeah. um, uh, but most of them are like half an hour. So you can just play the podcast, it discusses the topic, and then you can discuss with your associate or with your team member, what do you think about that? How do you think you right. could apply that to your life? How do you think yeah. that could help us grow a better practice here? And you can have a discussion using the topic that I provide every week on Monday. So that, that was the whole idea of, of uh, Cairo Feast. I love it. I love it. Um, well, Jeff, man, I, I, we're running over a little bit, and I apologize for taking up any extra time. But uh, I no just problem. I could talk to you for hours. Like you are, uh, you are one dude that I definitely look up to uh, when it comes to uh, just being out there, creating businesses, creating value, being a great guy. Um, and so I really appreciate your time. Any, uh, any parting words uh, for these, uh, the people out there? No, I, I appreciate you too, Nick. And, and when uh, we ran into each other just outside the elevator um, at Cairo Fest, uh, I think we probably burned a half an hour, 40 minutes just standing there. And Oh, for and, sure. That should have been the podcast. There was right, all kinds right, of good right, yeah. there. <laughs> so, no, I appreciate you and everything you're doing because what you're doing is, is for the profession. You know, and so thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for... Um, supporting the, the mission of our profession, which is to get people well and give people hope. Um, and as long as our focus stays there, and then also to help chiropractors deliver that hope in a better, more effective. And Just because this episode is over doesn't mean you can't continue your path to a million dollar practice. We've created Chiropractic's most full service marketing agency at Leverage Media to help you reach $1 million a year fast and continue to grow. You can get a free strategy session with me absolutely free right now. To get started, go to GetMeMoreNewPatients.com. Once again, go to GetMeMoreNewPatients.com, and we'll see you tomorrow on the Path to a Million podcast.